So non-current assets can be purchased in a few different ways. So let's start with, we go and buy a new vehicle and we pay for it with cash. So it says cash there. All right. Now, was any cash received by the business? If there was, it would get recorded in the cash receipts journal. There actually wasn't. We're the ones paying cash. So that won't be a cash receipt. Was there any cash paid? Yes, there was. So we have bought a new vehicle for cash. That would go in our cash payments journal. Let's take the exact same transaction, went and bought a new vehicle, and just change one thing. Instead of buying it for cash, we bought it for credit. So has the business received any money? No, it hasn't, so it won't go in the cash receipts journal. Has it paid any money? It has not, so it won't go in our cash payments journal. Has the business made a credit sale? It has not. Has it made a credit purchase of stock? Now, it has made a credit purchase, but the key word here is stock. So, we have not bought stock on credit. We have bought a non-current asset, in this case a vehicle. So, net result is we don't have a journal or a special journal that will record this type of transaction. So, therefore, we're going to have to put it in the general journal. Now, slight difference. Normally, we use a memo to record transactions in the general journal. That's not true. In this case, we'll get rid of that. And it'll still be a purchase invoice because we are buying on credit. So a purchase invoice will exist. It's just for a different type of item. Instead of it being stock, this is going to be for a non-current asset. So why doesn't this go in the purchases journal? Well, and that's simple. The purchases journal is, is for credit purchases, but only of stock. So therefore, if we're buying a non-stock item on credit, such as a car or a computer, uh, furniture, that sort of thing, that is going to go in the general journal uh, and it will still be a purchase invoice. So in summary, when we buy non-current assets, that occurs one of two ways. Now, if we pay for it with cash, like all cash payments, that would go on our cash payments journal. But if we buy it on credit, that is not a credit purchase of stock. So it's not going to go on our purchases journal. Where it will go instead is in our general journal. So that diagram there kind of sums up where we're at with non-current assets and the two ways we can buy them and where they get recorded. So let's take an example. On the 2nd of July, I've gone and bought a photocopier for $5,000 plus GST and it says it was with cash. So where would that one get recorded? That would go in our payments journal. So a transaction we've done before. We put the date in, we'd write the details, which would be photocopier. We've got the check number. We paid $5,500. And what we're buying is we're not buying stock, we're buying a photocopier. So we won't put this in our stock column here. What we'll do instead is that'll go in sundries. We don't have a column for buying a photocopier, so that'll go in sundries. Put in our GST, and that's a transaction we've been doing for months. So nothing there we don't know. What about if we go and buy stock costing $2,000 plus GST, says on credit from Deluxe Decor. So this is a transaction we've done as well, nothing new here. This one would go in our purchases journal. We put the date, the name of the creditor, and the invoice number, the amount of the stock, which is $2,000, $200 GST, and we owe $2,200 to a creditor. So nothing new there. This one is new. We've gone and bought a new vehicle for $35,000 from Newport Holden on credit. So for the first time, we're going to record this in the general journal. So we'll start with the date. We'll have a debit because we've gone and bought a new vehicle. So that'll go up $35,000. We've been charged some GST, so that'll decrease our GST liability with a debit. And then we've got a creditor called Newport Holden, and that is a liability and it's going up. So that'll be a credit, and we can see we've got two debits to match with one credit. We'll do an oration. I went and bought a vehicle on credit from Newport Holden, and I've got the invoice number. And then something slightly different to how we normally do things. If I went and bought stock on credit, what I'd have is what's called creditor's control, but I haven't done that here. No entry's been made in creditor's control, and I haven't made a subsidiary account. You can see the subsidiary uh, columns are blank. Why? Well, that comes down to a new little thing we've got to learn, and that is that there are two types of creditors. We've got a trade creditor, 
That's the one we've been doing. We know what that is. We just haven't given it a name. So a trade creditor is someone or a supplier that sells us stock on credit. What we do is we record all those in what's called creditors control. And then we give a subsidiary ledger to every single trade creditor. So that's how we've been recording all our purchases of stock on credit. That's different. If I bought a vehicle or a computer, some sort of non-current asset on credit, that's not a trade creditor. What that's called is a sundry creditor. So we'll define that as a supplier that provides goods other than stock on credit. So they basically are selling us a non-current asset. And in this unit four, that's the transaction we'll be doing, buying a non-current asset. And what we do is we record that in a separate creditor's ledger. And what we don't do is record it in creditor's control. Now, if we don't record it in creditor's control, we're not going to have a subsidiary ledger. So this system here, we don't need. What we're just going to do is give it its own separate creditor's ledger and not worry about a subsidiary account. So just to summarize, if I go and buy stock on credit, that'll go on my purchases journal. I classify that as a trade creditor, a creditor that sells me stock on credit. In the general ledger, I'd have creditors control, and then I'd make up a subsidiary ledger. So if, for example, the creditor's name was Jones, I'd, I'd create a creditor Jones account in the subsidiary ledger. If I go and buy a non-current asset on credit, we've learned that that's a little bit different. That won't go on my purchases journal, that'll go on my general journal. That's not a trade creditor. A trade creditor sells us stock. A sundry creditor sells us anything that's not stock on credit. And the general ledger will be different. What we'll do is, let's say this creditor's name was Smith, they will get their own account in the general ledger. We don't worry about creditor's control and we leave the subsidiary section blank. We don't need subsidiary ledgers for sundry creditors. So when we pay back a creditor, we've got a slight difference now. If I went and paid back a trade creditor, who are they? That's someone I bought stock from. So in my cash flow statement, is that an operating, investing, or financing activity? Well, paying back a trade creditor, that is to do with the daily uh, operations of the business, the buying and selling of stock. So that would be an operating activity called payments to creditors. What about when I pay back a sundry creditor? So I'm buying, say, a non-current asset that's a vehicle. Is that an operating, investing, or a financing? Well, it's still paying back a creditor. It's just a different type. So over here, we had a trade creditor. That's someone who sells me stock. That is going to be an operating activity. This is slightly different. This is a sundry creditor who sold me a non-current asset. And that's different. That is actually going to go on my investing section because if you remember, the investing activity section is to do with the buying and selling of non-current assets. So even though we're not buying a non-current asset on credit, we're paying them back now, that's still an investing activity. So you can see there's a slight difference in how we record the payments back to a trade creditor versus a sundry creditor.